Greetings, my dear viewer. This is a channel about marital infidelity and about the consequences if one spouse starts to cheat on the other. If you, as well as I do, support true family values and condemn cheating, then subscribe to the channel and give this video a like. Let's get started. I had no doubt that this was just bullying, but I couldn't resist. For 10 months now, I've been following a relentless regimen. 30 grueling minutes on an exercise bike, and then another 30 on a treadmill. The only thing that changed was the soundtrack, which I chose from an old MP3 player that became my lifeline. I didn't have a smartphone, but there was enough music to drown out not only the pain, but also the boiling anger that seemed to flare up in me every day. When heavy metal was playing in my ears, my mind was immersed in dark fantasies of revenge, which was a welcome escape from reality. Both exercises became mechanical, allowing me to plunge into a self-induced trance where I could wallow in rage caused by my wife's betrayal. After a quick rinse at the gym, I walked two miles to work. It would have been wiser to drive, but I found that the rhythm of my steps served as a soothing balm for my turbulent thoughts. Usually the walk took about an hour, stretching for a longer time if the weather decided to fool around. It wasn't a sprint, but it made my heart beat and my mind was busy. After a long day at work, I walked home at a more leisurely pace, enjoying the quiet moments. The weekend was a bit of a wild card. It disrupted my daily routine, but I used this opportunity to immerse myself in housework. I found solace in mowing the lawn, pruning hedges, and mowing flower beds, activities that allowed me to channel my energy into something useful. Minor tasks that I had previously dismissed suddenly demanded my attention. Painting walls and ceiling cracks turned from a simple job into fascinating projects that filled all my days. My trusty MP3 player became my constant companion, providing the soundtrack to my life while I was working. I was a mechanic by profession, specializing in the complex world of commercial diesel engines, and I was proud to keep my certifications up to date. Financially, we were stable enough to send my two daughters to college, but instead of burdening them with the weight of student loans, we decided to take out a second mortgage to cover tuition costs. Nevertheless, under this cover of stability, the roots of marital discord were emerging, and oddly enough, music was at the heart of it. My wife, Monica, was into classical music, which I just couldn't stomach. I did my best to take up her interests, hoping to bridge the gap, but alas, it was a lost cause. It would seem that the difference in musical tastes is not enough to destroy a marriage, but Monica went even further. She began to immerse herself in communities of like-minded musicians, joining local associations and willingly signing up for concerts. While she was basking in the company of fellow classical music enthusiasts, it never occurred to her to invite me with her. As her walks turned into sleepover escapades, I felt an urgent need to uncover the truth behind her newfound passion. David Allen appeared, a talented pianist who taught at a nearby college and performed with various orchestras. His concert tours took place in various major cities. It took me a while to realize that my wife had feelings for him. She hid her affection well, but the signs were unmistakable. She was indeed his personal companion on these trips. Having put together the real state of affairs, I realized that it was time to talk to her. Monica, we need to talk, I began preparing for the revelations. However, the conversation took an unexpected turn. Instead of denying anything, she greeted me with alarming confidence, saying, So what? At that moment, I realized that I was meddling in the wrong business, faced with a reality that turned out to be much more difficult than I could have imagined. I stood there, stunned by her reaction. I braced myself for a wave of remorse, for a glimmer of repentance. But instead, I was met with chilling indifference and defiant insolence. In that one moment, the fabric of our lives unraveled. At first, I was overcome by an irresistible surge of grief and sadness, which enveloped me in a heavy cloak. The pain stabbed through me like a knife, but I forced myself to maintain a semblance of composure. I remained silent, not wanting to share my feelings with my daughters or anyone else. Meanwhile, Monica continued to live her life as if nothing had changed under our feet. She continued to do her usual chores cooking, cleaning, and housekeeping with a normality that seemed surreal. The only tangible change? 
I was banished to the guest room. Monica, who had never worked, filled her days with friends and adventures, her laughter echoing through the corridors of our once happy home. Although we lived under the same roof, our relationship became more like that of brother and sister rather than husband and wife. As she began to lead a bolder lifestyle, images of Monica and David began to appear in local newspapers and magazines. Not once did they mention my existence or the marriage ties that bound us. The grief turned into a boiling anger that threatened to engulf me. I was a volcano ready to erupt. Instead of drowning my grief in alcohol, I directed my anger to the gym, lost a lot of weight and gained a physique that I could not even dream of. Instead, I gave up my blood pressure and cholesterol medications, focusing on solitary dinners at home, and adjusted with surprising ease to the dishes that Monica cooked. But with every kilogram I dropped, I found that I was gaining a heavy load of bitterness. Ten times. I was turning into a resentful, embittered shell of my old self. Even my friends and colleagues began to distance themselves. Their avoidance was a painful reminder of my isolation. I met Thomas. He had been a regular at the gym for about two months before our paths finally crossed. I was one of those who preferred to stay in the shadows during training, almost without making eye contact with anyone. A few people exchanged nods or quick handshakes, but Thomas was a silent observer in this bustling world of fitness. From time to time I caught his glances when he was talking thoughtfully to himself. It's funny that when you put on headphones, you can forget about what you're singing or mumbling to yourself. One day, lost in his thoughts, he saw me grinning, and at the same moment, a connection was born between us. From that moment on, we began to communicate easily with each other, sharing a treadmill and eventually switching to a rowing machine. I found his concentration contagious, and it became clear that we were driven by the same fire. Coffee after training soon turned into regular lunches, and Thomas turned from a simple acquaintance into a real friend. For the first time in a long time, I had someone to share my thoughts with, someone who could empathize with my difficulties. But instead of easing my burdens, this newfound friendship caused me a different kind of disappointment. Thomas was not interested in running on a treadmill. In fact, he avoided running altogether. Physically, he was more than capable, but psychologically, he had a wall of resistance. The irony was that his wife, Anita, was an avid athlete completely immersed in the world of fitness, which he did not seem to want to participate in. Six years ago, she started a rigorous fitness program, and it became her lifeline. Cycling, swimming, running, these activities consumed her time and energy. And what is the most interesting thing? She's never done it alone. Marathons, competitions, yes, she participated in them, fiercely competing and achieving success. And Thomas stayed away never once inviting her to join the adrenaline chaos. Clark Harris was not just an athlete. He was a triathlon legend, and when he offered Anita his escort services, a wave swept through our little world. Thomas quickly put the puzzle together. They drove together, lived in a hotel, ate and even attended various events. He told his wife about it, but her reaction was dismissive. Get over it. One evening when Thomas and I were eating delicious ribs, Everything fell into place. Monica was on a trip with David, and Anita flew to the islands, where she was accompanied by the charming Clark Harris. The ribs would have tasted even better if they had been washed down with a few mugs of cold beer, but we preferred unsweetened tea. You know, Steve, Thomas sighed, we're a pathetic pair of fools. He did not smile but seemed to be lost in thought. His expression was gloomy. Damn it, Thomas, I refuse to be a cuckold. But what do you call two guys who perfectly understand that their wives are playing with them and just accept it? I paused, feeling his words hanging in the air. I waved at the waitress. My voice was casual. Bring us a couple of beers, please. I'm not a cuckold, I repeated, and determination crept into my voice. Prove it, Thomas snapped. Steve, we are both pathetic fools, drowning our sorrows in exercises to the point of pain. Do your daughters even understand what's going on? When was the last time you talked to them? What about your wife and your daughters? How often do they talk? Thank God I don't have children to worry about, I replied, bitterness creeping into my tone. Thomas and I shrugged, taking another bite of the rib, 
and a heavy silence fell between us. What should we do now? I started the whole weekend as usual, doing yard work in the warm sun, not knowing when Monica would be back. To be honest, I didn't really care. I figured she'd be around for the weekend. After a light lunch that barely satisfied my appetite, I met Thomas at the gym. Anita, after all, won't be back for five days. During our training session, Thomas shared with me the words from Anita that triathletes need to decompress before flying. He chuckled, realizing that this was mostly nonsense, but did not try to convince her otherwise. Our training session ended, and I felt a wave of disappointment wash over me. That's enough for me. That's enough. Thomas grabbed a towel and headed for the shower, leaving me alone with my thoughts. By the time I was done, he was already dressed and out the door, which only increased my sense of urgency. We needed a plan. I spent all Sunday brainstorming, but my every idea was quickly swept away by a flood of self-doubt. The most tempting thought was to pack up and disappear completely. But deep down, I knew that this would leave a gaping void in my life. I wanted some kind of payback and revenge, but who exactly was I supposed to target? It wasn't just one person, but a whole web of four people who had wronged me. Physical confrontation was out of the question. Conscience would not allow it. I was sure Thomas felt the same way about Anita, but these two? It was a completely different fish. Physical violence was ruled out, and I was left to think about how to make them feel the reproach of retribution, something that would leave its mark but would not cross the line. In an instant, everything fell into place. I rushed to the garage, my heart pounding, until I found what I needed, a hammer paired with a ballpoint pen. It was Sunday evening, and Monica walked through the door, radiating an infectious glow. She was full of life, had just unpacked and showered, but she didn't talk about her weekend adventures. I decided to mind my own business. When she fell asleep, I sat down at the TV. Steve, I'm not going to do this. You're not doing well. Seriously, you're crazy. No, I'm not going to beat anyone up in any way. Look, Thomas, you don't understand. We're not talking about murder, Steve insisted, his tone harsh. But that's exactly how it sounds. We're not taking lives. We're just slowing things down a bit. But what's the point? What are we even going to achieve with this? I continued, my voice dropping to a conspiratorial whisper. Tell me, Thomas. Why is your wife so fascinated by this guy? What does he have that you don't? Why does she want him? The answer was painfully obvious. He's a world-class super athlete, Steve. I can't compete with him. I'm just a forklift operator, and let's be honest, I'm not going to win any bodybuilding competitions anytime soon. At the same time, this so-called world-class athlete is trying to take your wife away from you. Is that fair? Not even close. This guy walks around like he's untouchable, like he can knock down any woman without thinking. This is the highest degree of disrespect, and yet it is you who feel devastated. You can't just let him go. I know it seems impossible for you to stand up to him, but here's the thing. You won't have to do it alone. I'll take the initiative. So, what's the plan? Well, there's a legendary pianist known all over the world who might need a little manual therapy for his delicate fingers. Do you agree? It all depends on the situation. Will I need a ball hammer for this? Thomas, use all the tools you have, just do the job. As a result, we shook hands. To calm Thomas's nerves, I promised to deal with the situation with Clark first, which I hope will give him confidence to deal with David later. We spent the next two hours over a plate of ribs that could put most dishes to shame, immersing ourselves in each other's lives, sharing secrets and strategies, and devising a plan for our unlikely return. The plan was riddled with gaps, and the biggest obstacle was Jin. Jin's physical strength made him a formidable obstacle, and it was clear that I needed some kind of equalizer to even the odds. Plunging into a new, intriguing plan, I put aside thoughts of my wife and her infidelity, allowing myself to be distracted and absorbed. I decided to take a solid 10-day vacation, fully devoting my time to uncovering secrets about Jean Harris. What I thought was a simple task quickly turned into a web of difficulties. Clark lived a seemingly ordinary life as an insurance agent, but in fact, it was far from that simple. His daily routine was a whirlwind of activity. He went jogging in the morning and turned into a fish three times a week, 
swimming laps in the local pool until the pool lights went out. When the rain forced others to stay at home, he went to the gym, proving that fitness is a priority. However, what is the most interesting thing? Two or three times a week he retired to his apartment, where Anita was waiting for him. While I was digging into the gin tracks, my friend Thomas was busy keeping an eye on David. Our gym meetings were filled with sweat and grumbling, but we never touched on our individual missions. We didn't even exchange phone numbers. It was all part of the strategy. We were only connected by a gym membership. As the hours passed, I felt the pressure to come up with a plan. Jin was unpredictable, constantly changing his cycling routes, which made tracking him even more difficult. I needed to come up with something, and quickly. Without stopping on the same path, he always aspired to new horizons. The best thing was to catch him after swimming practice. I watched him park his car in the shade at the back of the building, and my heart was pounding with anticipation. How many hours I spent searching for surveillance cameras, several in front, several on the sides, but the back remained a blind spot. In a fit of bravery, I quietly purchased a taser at an auction. I wasn't completely sure what it was working on or how to test it, but I decided it was now or never. At least there was an instruction manual attached to it, a small consolation in this whirlwind of uncertainty. I also bought a balaclava to disguise myself for the upcoming night. We spent about 30 minutes on the treadmill. Our conversation was light and relaxed, the kind that dances around real problems. But as the minutes passed, I felt a weight of seriousness weigh on me. Thomas, I said, leaning closer, I think you need to take a 10-day vacation. I don't need to know the destination, but I need these dates. And wherever you go, be sure to use your credit cards. Lots of credit cards. After half an hour of training on the rowing machine, Clark was practically beaming from the workout and from the delight caused by my offer. Now the ball was in my power, and I had to think about my next move. It was raining slowly outside, soaking everything in its path. It was close to ten o'clock, and I knew that at any moment Clark Harris would appear through the back door. His Audi was the only car left in the dimly lit back lot. I checked again. There were still no surveillance cameras. I pulled a balaclava over my face, preparing for what would happen next. Anger seized him the moment he noticed a flat tire, an annoying turn in an already difficult day. Just five minutes later, the taser did its job perfectly, and I was back on the road, my heart pounding with adrenaline. It didn't make the morning headlines, but there was a brief report on the evening news about a resident who was attacked and injured the night before. Authorities were hastily installing surveillance cameras in the area to prevent future incidents, but details about the victim's injuries remained shrouded in mystery. No one could find a clue, a suspect, or a clear motive for the attack. Meanwhile, I had lost track of Thomas. His whereabouts were completely mysterious, and the date of his return was uncertain. The hammer, stun gun, and balaclava were now lying in three different dumpsters in the city center, the remnants of a chaotic night. When I announced at work about the upcoming three-week driver training course in another city, my boss was far from thrilled. He couldn't understand how my training in marine engines could benefit the company. I'll pay for the course myself and take advantage of my vacation, I assured him, but he continued to frown. But before I left, I put a note in Thomas's gym locker, telling him that I would be out of town until the end of June. Monica, I'm going to Orlando for three weeks of training. Do you want to join me or would you rather chill at home? Steve, the summer concert season is in full swing. You know how much I love park activities. I'd rather stay here, she replied with a note of reluctance in her voice. You're going to be in class most of the time anyway, aren't you? Yes, that's the plan. With a sigh, I resigned myself to the fact that our paths would separate in the next few weeks, and the excitement of training overshadowed the chaos that reigned in my head. I know why you're hesitant to go, but I just had to ask. Thanks, honey. I really appreciate your offer, but I think I'll feel safer staying here for now. Maybe we can have a little outing this summer. Maybe a delightful weekend trip somewhere else. Of course, the conversation took place exactly as I expected. So, let's move on to the next chapter of my plan. There was still nothing known about Jean Harris. I set off at dawn on Saturday, intending to get to Colorado in two days with a stopover. Because, let's be honest, priorities matter. Fortunately, 
I found a school where I could rent a long-term apartment with a kitchen. Eating out every day was not my style. As soon as I was settled, I called Monica to inform her of my safe arrival. I decided to subscribe to an online newspaper for just a dollar a month. It was a small price to pay to keep up to date. Starting tomorrow, I'll be watching all the news from home, especially the police reports. I couldn't wait to see if Thomas would keep his end of the bargain. I also couldn't shake the anticipation that the police might take some action against him in connection with the Harris situation. There was a training hall a mile from my house and I was happy to use my guest subscription. The first week of my vacation was slow, the second began to arouse interest, and by the third it turned into something truly fantastic. I'm not talking about my school preparation, which was just exceptional. Every morning, I immersed myself in the newspaper, eagerly scanning its pages in search of a fascinating story. Recently, my wife's friend organized a concert, a delightful little affair which I'm sure she liked. But as the week went on, a chilling front-page article caught my attention. The brutal attack on David Allen, a respected professor at a local university and conductor of a symphony orchestra. The police suspected that professional hostility was involved in the case, since the only injuries he received were his hands. They drew disturbing parallels with the recent attack on Clark Harris, but could not connect the two cases. There were no leads, no suspects. That evening, I was trying to figure out how Thomas managed to organize such chaos. Deep down, I wasn't sure I wanted an answer, but the excitement of speculation was too tempting to resist. The next morning, the school administrator contacted me and informed me that an official representative had confirmed my presence in class and that I had not missed a single lesson. I didn't expect anything else, but I was wondering when my wife would finally get in touch. A few days passed without news, and I decided to take the initiative and took another package just in case. But the long-awaited call never came. Surprisingly, the last school week turned out to be the most exciting. We spent half a day interviewing potential employers, which I never expected. To be honest, at that moment, any job offer seemed like a victory to me. My age, experience, and willingness to explore new horizons gave me a clear advantage over my fellow students. When the cherished offer was on my lap, the choice was not long in coming. When I was returning home, I was drawn to a spontaneous excursion. The local newspaper still didn't know anything about the mysterious attacks that everyone was talking about, and to my horror, Monica hadn't been in touch since our last conversation. The view from the marina was stunning. Mike Lee, the owner of the yacht, was pleased to show me his pride and joy. The marina had not only first-class repair and maintenance services, but also an extensive multi-level warehouse. A handful of boats bobbed gently at the dock, their hulls glistening in the sun. The cherry on top was a cozy mobile home nestled in the backyard, which Mike generously offered me to use, completely free of charge. Being interested in the vault, I asked Mike to tell me more about it. He said with a grin that this is a favorite habitat for kingfishers. After talking about the intricacies of the job, he playfully asked if I had any experience working with a forklift, and my mind instantly switched to thoughts about Thomas. I had a strange feeling of peace at home. My loving wife greeted me with warm hugs and sweet kisses on the cheek, but there was a certain unspoken distance in the atmosphere. Several times I tried to start a light conversation, but Monica's answers were limited to superficial chatter. Not a word about David. I didn't insist, deciding to keep my thoughts to myself. After refreshing ourselves in the shower and quickly changing our clothes, we sat down to a simple dinner. It seemed that I had never left, despite twenty days on the road. The next morning I had a serious workout in the gym. When I entered the hall, he was there, Thomas, as reliable as ever. Hello, Thomas. Good morning, Steve. We plunged into our usual routine, lasted twenty minutes in silence, each immersed in his own thoughts. A strange moment that seemed a little surreal. Finally, the tension became unbearable. Let's have some coffee, Thomas, I stammered. Damn, I thought you'd never ask. Without refreshing ourselves, we grabbed our things and headed to the cafe across the street. Steve, how are you holding up? I asked, feeling the weight of the silence that hung between us. He shrugged, his expression distant. It's like I never left. 
If it wasn't for the articles in the newspapers, I wouldn't have suspected what happened. It was completely different on my part, I replied with a note of disappointment. Anita is completely furious and takes it out on me. The police have completely cleared my name, but they are sure that I played a role in his attack. She practically lives at his house, playing the role of a nurse and even stayed with him for a few nights. Strangely, it was kind of a relief, I admitted. I find that I enjoy the time spent apart from her more than the time spent with her. You did a great job with him. His triathlon days are officially over. Although I had my doubts, he raised an eyebrow. I never found out the details about his injuries. Did the police bother you? They were combing through my phone conversations and bank accounts, trying to find at least some connection to the attack. After a grueling week, they finally gave up. Anita was relentless and worked hard to get me charged. Just out of curiosity, where did you disappear to during all this? He asked. I was on a trip. It was great, he said, and a smile appeared on my face. What about you? I guess you've been stuck in class forever. Yes, I said with a mocking sigh. Eight hours a day for three long weeks. That's not exactly the feeling. So what's next on the agenda, Steve? To be honest, I can't wait to break free. I found a job in Colorado and I'm getting ready to hit the road by the end of the week. Are you really going to get a divorce? Two. Remember why. I'm loading up and leaving. If she wants to leave, let her pull the trigger herself. I sincerely wonder if David will take a step forward and take her in or leave her too. What about your house and all your possessions? I'm leaving her everything except the cash in the bank. She can handle the mortgage, car payments, utilities, and even a credit card on her own. It will give me much needed peace of mind. Just promise me you'll keep me posted on what you're going to do, okay? Of course. By the way, did David give you any trouble? Not really. It's just that yesterday I had a little fun in the garage. I sprayed the surveillance cameras with wasp spray, and then I took a kitchen hammer to finish the job. One quick blow to the head, followed by several hard blows to each arm. I even took care to knock off both of his thumbs. And what is the most interesting thing? He never saw it happen. When I returned from the gym, Monica was not at home. I took a quick shower and went to work, where my boss almost exploded when I wrote my resignation letter. I emptied all my bank accounts, leaving only a couple hundred bucks, and closed all my credit cards. It's time to start a new chapter. We have always maintained a zero balance on these accounts, a reflection of our simple lifestyle. After another leisurely dinner with my wife, I uncorked a cold beer and retired to the closet, where the air was filled with anticipation. With a sense of accomplishment, I took out my passport, birth certificate, and my basic documents, the trifecta of my identity. I wasn't going to pack anything else. The work tools were already in the back seat of my car, ready for a new adventure. All that was left was to pack clothes and a laptop. Monica was always friendly and at the same time a mystery, and her reserved nature only increased the intrigue. The next morning, she disappeared early and kept her destination a secret from me for over a year. She probably thought it was better not to burden my life with knowledge. I loaded things into my trusty companion in less than half an hour. At the last moment, I grabbed a grill. It seemed to me a bizarre but practical addition. As I was driving along the highway, I was suddenly seized with the desire to inform Thomas of my departure. It was enough to send a quick message. Whatever his reaction, I accepted it. I managed to get used to the new environment in just a few weeks. The phone remained turned off. It was a conscious choice to disconnect from the past. The job I found was a curious mixture of the familiar and the new, and there was a strange comfort in its duality. Most of my free time was occupied by the process of turning the trailer into a cozy home. It functioned quite well, but required a little care and attention. Meanwhile, the second bedroom turned into a place to collect all sorts of things, chaotic evidence of my hasty move. Just a quarter of a mile from the house was a charming little diner, which was bustling with life, open around the clock. Soon I got into the habit of dining in it, enjoying a greasy meal. Unfortunately, the nearest gym was eight miles from home, so I decided to lace up my sneakers and go outside, adopting the rhythm of running as my new habit. I wasn't particularly excited about the idea of playing sports, but I forced myself to do it anyway. At least the route was smooth no hills. 
Just as I was catching my breath, the doorbell rang. Thomas, have you really come? I exclaimed, surprised. It's not very difficult, is it, Steve? He chuckled. Thanks to the navigator who guided him like a faithful companion, he got there without any problems. I asked, Are you just passing through or are you planning to stay? I will stay if there is an empty seat, he replied with a note of fatigue in his voice. I have nowhere else to go. After spending an hour arranging it in the second bedroom, we went to the diner for dinner. The poor guy spent a grueling fifteen hours on the road and fatigue weighed on him. I left him to rest the next morning, knowing that he needed it. Sometime later, Mike Lee hired Thomas, which was an unexpected turn of fate for him. He had a real dislike for forklifts and was glad to put them in his hands. The pay wasn't too high, but Thomas didn't seem to care much about that. His priority was simply to earn enough to make a living. He even took a nice stash of cash with him, which made the task a little easier. Later, he put the money in a safe deposit box in the same bank that he used himself. It seemed to me that this was a reasonable move, given that the safety of his trailer was questionable at best. Meanwhile, Anita insisted to the police that Thomas was guilty of attacking Clark Harris. Despite her claims, the evidence was flimsy at best. Thomas's reliable alibi left no doubt, and the accomplices could not be identified. With each passing day, the tension between Thomas and Anita grew stronger. The air was filled with unspoken accusations and mistrust. Anita's voice echoed through the house as she demanded Thomas leave, but he stubbornly stood his ground. Deciding on a bold step, she packed up and moved in with a friend, and just two days later Thomas disappeared without a trace. I decided it was time to turn to my daughters. I dialed Anastasia, the eldest, but she wouldn't let me say a word before hanging up. Annabelle, my youngest, was much less delicate. Before cutting the connection, she hurled a barrage of insults at me, calling me an arrogant bastard. After that, I realized that my efforts were useless. At least in the near future, I won't have to worry about paying the bills for extravagant weddings. I turned off the phone, feeling a strange mixture of relief and defeat. Thomas and I quickly got into the usual rhythm of life. Every morning I would lace up my sneakers and run five miles, and then we would meet at our favorite diner for breakfast. They even cooked a special low-carb dish especially for me. Lunch was a flexible, casual affair when our schedules matched. But after a couple of weeks, the rhythm of our days changed. For the past seven months, Liza has been living on her sailboat. Having no car of his own, Thomas gladly became her chauffeur, and soon my breakfast companion was no longer available. Dinner also turned into solitude, and I watched as the second bedroom of our trailer gradually turned into a junk room. Thomas looked blissfully happy, and I couldn't help but feel a sense of joy for him. However, every time I tried to figure out his relationship with Liza, he evaded answering my questions, and his evasiveness was a wall that I couldn't break through. Mike Lee, our mutual friend, didn't shed any light either. He was only satisfied that she paid her bills on time and never asked for special treatment. Having settled into a new, peaceful life, I could not get rid of the feeling that everything had irrevocably changed. I chose to stay in the shadows, letting life unfold around me. But for now, Thomas was smiling his satisfied smile. Time was slipping through my fingers like sand. It had been almost a year since I had left my old life. I haven't heard a word from my wife my daughters, or anyone else at home. In my world, there were only Thomas and Liza and our rare dinners, which always ended with laughter and friendly communication. During our meals together, I learned a little about Liza. She was a military wife with no children to tie her to. Her husband remained a mystery. She never mentioned him, and I respected her silence. Then came a rainy Monday morning that seemed very different. The storm thundered all night, flooding everything in its path, and the downpour was not going to weaken. Instead of the usual morning run, I put on my old army poncho and went to the diner. Savoring my second cup of coffee, I was enjoying the warm aroma filling the air when I noticed a familiar sight. A green car stopped at the pier. Clark Harris was in town. A woman jumped out of the car, which, as I later learned, was Anita, opened an umbrella and hurried to the marina office. Her movements were fast and decisive. A moment later, she opened the door and beckoned to the driver. Jin got out of the car, limping slightly, 
trying to dodge the relentless raindrops, a funny struggle with the wrath of nature. Damn it, Thomas, pick up the phone! After what seemed like an eternity, he finally answered. Thomas, you're in trouble, I said, and an urgent plea crept into my voice. How soon can you leave this place? What are you talking about? Slow down, he replied, confusion in his voice. Your wife is here, and Jean Harris is with her. They were busy talking to Mike in the office, and I had to make a decision. Approach her, or leave unnoticed. The incessant rain outside could serve as the perfect cover to slip away unnoticed. It may take ten or twenty minutes, I said, and an urgent plea crept into my voice. Can you hold them off a little longer? He asked, his brows furrowed in concern. I'll try, I replied, already plotting an escape. Now go ahead. My next call was to Mike. He grinned almost mischievously, agreeing to redirect our unexpected guests to my trailer. I managed to get back to my trailer just as they were leaving the office. Naturally, I invited them inside, wanting to stretch these minutes as long as possible. It was surreal. Here I am chatting casually with a man I attacked less than a year ago, and the memory of our brutal encounter is still fresh. I hoped that the newly grown facial hair would hide my excitement and tried to keep the conversation light. They seemed to have no reason to visit, no real interest in why they were looking for Thomas. I didn't press them for answers. As we walked to the pier, the rain eased and turned into a dreary drizzle. A thick fog was coming, obscuring the tugboat on the other side of the bay, but I was the only one who noticed it. They were fixated on the empty dock, their eyes glazed over. Five minutes passed, and the ship was completely out of sight. I kept my identity to myself and didn't reveal how I knew Thomas. They didn't seem to be going to ask. I took my leave, saying that I had a job. They left soon after, and I never saw Thomas again. A few months later, Ryan, Laura brother-in-law, came looking for Warren, Laura husband. It's been over a year since Ryan last heard from him. The couple docked at the pier, and several statements about a domestic conflict were filed against them, but they all mysteriously stopped. Warren, a retired Air Force veteran, continued to receive retirement checks, but no one had seen him or Laura for over a year. It was a mystery that hung in the air, burdened with unanswered questions. I was puzzled by how he managed to find Laura at the marina. Perhaps it was just a lucky guess. Six months have passed, and I found that I miss Thomas more than I'd like to admit. My job provided stability, but the monotony was starting to suffocate me. In the evenings, I spent time with my faithful pet, thinking about whether I should look for a companion or change the situation. The bars were out of my sight, and the church wasn't in my life either. I felt more awkward than cheerful at the gym, and the waitresses at the diner weren't charming enough to think about a date. It was then, when I thought that I would remain stagnant forever, that I decided to apply to my former place of work again. They had two promising vacancies, in two different cities. When I was sitting at lunch and thinking about a decision, an uninvited guest brought me out of my reverie. Hi, Steve. It's hard to track you down, Monica said, a heaviness in her voice reflecting the effects of the last three years. She looked older, haggard, and I couldn't help but feel remorse. I'm sorry I wasn't hiding. What brings you here? I asked, curious. She put the envelope on the table and looked at me. Your latest divorce papers. I thought you might need them. I filed for divorce a year ago, and if you knew where to find me, why not just mail them? I don't know, she replied, her voice trembling slightly. Maybe I needed to decide something. You really tricked me. I sighed, feeling the weight of her words. But I probably deserved it, she admitted. That was not my intention. I just wanted to step back so you could be with David. I felt like I was holding you back. Well, you didn't leave me that much, she replied, and the harshness of her words hung in the air between us. At that moment, I realized how confusing our past has become and how uncertain my future remains. With empty pockets and the house taken away by the bank, the real kick was the loss of David in this chaos. To be honest, I thought your lover would have the decency to stay. By the way, where is he now? After the accident, David had a hard time. He packed up and returned to his homeland about six months ago. 
Didn't you go with him? I wasn't on the guest list. I kept my mouth shut then. David felt reproached, convinced that you had played a role in his misfortune. Strangely enough, after that incident, relations between us seem to have improved. But we're not on good terms right now. Anastasia tied the knot last June and opened a store. I planned to move in with her, ready to accept the role of grandmother. But first I decided to drop by her place and drop off your newspapers. What a fool I was. As a result, I was sitting there waiting for an apology that never came, and I felt more like a punching bag than a friend. As if you still wanted to put salt on my wounds. There was no sign of remorse or regret on your part. Well, Monica, I'm glad you decided to stop by. I'm sorry I missed Anastasia's wedding, but I guess she didn't want me there anyway. And I'm sincerely sorry that things turned out better with you and David. I know how much it meant to you. Is there anything else you want to say before you leave? I wanted to apologize to you for everything. I was an idiot. I ruined 32 years of our marriage. Give me one last chance. I burst out laughing at her words. This woman had ignored me for years, and now she wants to be with me. It was funny. No. Goodbye. I despise liars. My friend, and this is the end of the story. If you liked this story, then put your royal like and subscribe to the channel. May the force be with you.